Very good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great honour to be presenting the first Steve Hewlett debate. And as Chris says, it couldn't be more topical, given where we are. Fake news has always existed, of course. There have always been lies in the media. There's always been propaganda. But we are arguably at a unique place, a unique time when the leader of the United States routinely uses it as a term of abuse, where British politicians accuse mainstream media interviewers of purveying fake news when they're asking inconvenient questions. Uh, the fake news is now designed in a way to genuinely deceive users of social media into thinking they are reading real news. It looks very similar. It's pretty hard to spot. And all the research shows that most people do find it pretty hard to spot. So we want to discuss today the challenges that poses for those who are working in the established media and, and the, uh, the new emerging media as well. Let's take a look. Uh, uh, we've put together a video that just sort of tees up some of the key issues. Well, that, that tees up quite a lot. Let me introduce our distinguished and brilliant uh, panel. Right next to me is Tony Maddox, Managing Director of CNN International, who are, of course, having a pretty extraordinary time uh, under the Trump presidency. He's come over from Atlanta to be with us. Thank you very much indeed. Next to Tony is Versha Sharma, um, who's senior correspondent at Now This. Now, they're a startup um, who, if, you're, if, if you get your news from Facebook, you will have seen, almost certainly. Um, they get a billion views a month. They're absolutely huge. Um, and uh, and Versha oversaw their 2016 election coverage from their New York headquarters. Jamie Angus is the deputy director of the BBC World Service and a former editor of the Today programme. He was leading that programme uh, during the, the Brexit referendum campaign. And next to Jamie is Damien Collins, who's chair of the Culture, Digital Media and Sports Select Committee, who are due to be holding an inquiry into the whole question of fake news and what must be done about it. But let's begin by defining our terms, if you like, and, and just working out because fake news is lots of different things to lots of different people. I mean, Jamie, can you, can you break it down for us? Yeah, absolutely. And I think the VT set this out really, really helpfully. So uh, for me, there are three categories. Firstly, there's a clickbait operation, which is basically ad fraud. So it's just trying to drive clickbait for commercial revenues under something that appears to be desirable, which is kind of click clicky shareable news stories. I think the second thing is... Um, uh, you know, an argument about whether political advocacy and opinion sites are news or not. So it's a similar dimension of argument around the Canary or Breitbart, or it's just like, you know, uh, people who, who are publishing content of some quality, but is it actually news or is it kind of advocacy for a particular political point of view? And then I think the third category is the most pernicious, which is kind of state-backed activity with, with designed with a particularly malign intent to manipulate, uh, you know, um, usually elections, but often other kind of intergroup conflicts, you know, e ethnic troubles. and, and Which in other parts of the world is... Well, absolutely. Huge. I was just going to say, you know, with, with <coughs> my international perspective on this is that actually we don't have a, a really big fake news problem in the UK. We have a strong regulatory framework and quality for, the, for that reason and for other reasons is generally high. We're, we're a stable and, you know, a, a stable democracy. And I think in lots of other countries where I've been to this year and talking about fake news, people have come up with really, really worrying real world examples of where uh, malign fake news is being used to ferment, um, you know, I I ethnic conflict, political conflict in specific territories. And I think a, a sense of perspective about what the, you know, what the real world outcomes of this is necessary in considering it all around the globe. And would you put Trump into that third category? No, I mean, I think it's, a, you know, I'm, my personal view is that, I'm interested in what Tony say about this, my personal view is, you know, the US is a, a, a big, stable, old enough, ugly enough democracy in the long term to find its own way through this. I think what, pati what particularly worries me, though, is that is not actually that Donald Trump is attacking CNN or us. Was he attacking us? I don't know. It wasn't really clear. But it's not that so much. It's that just that in other countries around the world, which are a lot less stable than the US, and where actual lives, lots of lives, are really at stake here, people look at what the president says, and they take their lead from him. They go, OK, that's working. So attacking all media 
uh, in a blanket attack work, so I'm going to try it here. And that's a global problem. Virtual, I mean, what, what do you think is the, the, the most pernicious bit of fake news from your perspective? I mean, going back to what President Trump is doing, sadly, in America, I think he's basically rendered the phrase meaningless because he calls anything that he doesn't like fake news and his supporters and people who um, tend to be apologists for him do the same. And so while we can talk about, at least industry-wide, we have these very different categories of what we define as fake news, when you're talking about the broader American public, we just have people shouting at us when we go to cover a Trump rally that we're like, we're their opponents, we're, we're the people that they're supposed to be antagonizing. So it's not just other world leaders who are taking their cues from Trump, but it's people in America who are now harassing and threatening, sometimes assaulting reporters because they believe we're all fake news. I think that's the biggest, one of the biggest challenges that we're facing right now. Um, Damien, from your political perspective, which is the bit of it that really worries you? Well, I mean, the, um, the state sponsored uh, the state sponsorship of fake news is very concerning because it has a hard political edge. These aren't just you know, people gaming uh, what is effectively a spam type problem on social media to make, make money out of it. They have people who've got a political agenda. One of their political agendas we should all be very concerned about is that these are these pe people who come from countries or are countries where they don't have a free media. Uh, and what they're trying to say is there's really no such thing as a free media because all the media is biased. You know, the United Kingdom, the United States, their media is biased. It's not true. There are things they choose not to report. There are things that they get wrong. So don't complain about the media in this country because it's a worldwide problem. And unfortunately, what, what President Trump is doing is feeding that. Feeding that idea that there's, no, that there's only really opinion and subjective opinion. There's no such thing as real fact and hard news. And we have to fight back against that. Now we have to fight back at that using the tools that I think the digital companies could have available if they chose to make them available to combat it directly by being clearer about calling out things that are wrong. And I think for a politician to say in our discourse with the media as well, I think to, to go back to a position which we lost at the last election, which is you know, when politicians can't answer questions and get their facts hopelessly wrong, that's seen as a bad thing, not just a matter of opinion, whether you think they meant it or not. I, I mean, Tony, let's just break down Trump a little bit. I mean, of course he waged war on the media throughout his campaign, but that, that press conference that we saw a clip of mm -hmm. where he called Jim Acosta fake news was a real moment because he was saying that as the president of the United States. Mm. Do you remember how it felt at CNN? I remember very well because um, the story that we had broken was that the dossier existed um, suggesting he, that the Russians believed they had compromising information on him. And we had broadcast the story that he'd been briefed on that. And we got from three different sources in the end that he had genuinely been briefed by the CIA, by all the security forces that he'd been briefed about it. We didn't publish the briefing itself because we couldn't stand it up, the document. BuzzFeed but did, didn't they? They but did, yeah. and then that conflated a little bit. But it's important to understand at that point that we had, and we never have actually broadcast any of the individual allegations, but we had said that the President of the United States has been briefed by his security chiefs that the Russians believe they have compromising information on him. That is a massive story. So when he went after Jim Acosta there, just saying fake news, fake news, fake news, absolutely nothing that we broadcast then has been proved to be fake. But did you feel he was declaring war on you? Oh, I mean, did for you feel sure. under threat? Oh, no, there was too much feel under threat. And we knew that there'd be a reaction. I mean, obviously, we knew that they were, that, that they were pissed off. Um, and we weren't quite sure how it was going to manifest itself, but that he wouldn't take his question. I mean, it set the tone off the back of that. Everything was different. You know, CNN's you know, respected figure like Jim Acosta, who's got years of experience and never done a fake news story that I'm ever aware of, to be treated like that and hounded like that and singled out like that, everything changed from that moment onwards. I mean, the head of CBS famously said, you know, don't, don't know how good Trump is for America, but he's good for CBS. Yeah. Isn't the truth that Trump is pretty good for CNN? Well, the truth is that, to, to go to the point that you were making about how impactful these claims of fake news are, there's two ways in which it's impactful. I think in terms of reinforcing the prejudices of the base and people who genuinely don't like mainstream media, I think it's put some wind in their sails, without doubt. But if you look at the alternative, the groups that Trump has primarily targeted, um, CNN, New York Times, Washington Post, Saturday Night Live, um, Stephen Colbert, every single one of those I've mentioned has seen a quite remarkable growth in their uh, viewing figures, in their sales figures. 
So I think two things are happening. I think that for sure it's playing with the base, but it's also playing with people who are rejecting that very forcefully. So I think you know being called out for fake news by Trump isn't necessarily the end of the world. In fact, the evidence would suggest, as far as media organisations concerned, it's not something to worry about. But you, I mean, you must be doing audience research. I we mean, are. Is, is is the message that that you're all fake news? You know, draining trust away from CNN or not? So it's a good question because we we did a survey, a massive survey, across the whole of the US, and say this is the president calling us out on a regular basis, is it having any kind of eroding effect on us at all? And the answer, honestly, is it is not. It literally isn't having any impact on the broad stream part. I think what it's doing is it's making those who want the question, president to be questioned and held to account more loyal and more actively seeking out those people who are doing that. And it's making those who are supportive of the president and don't like mainstream media reinforced in that as well. But I don't think that, well, we didn't see any evidence from that survey or any that we've done that had any impact at all. And our ratings and our um, internet usage figures, we are at record levels right now. So he's good for business? Well, he is good for business. Yeah, I mean, I want to say it because it's like a glib thing to say. You know, there's a lot more to it than that. But you did ask a specific question of has it impacted our performance? And no, it hasn't. We, our performance has been enhanced during this news period and now we've chosen to cover it. Does it make you uh, protagonist, though? I mean, you're, you're in a very different environment to the British regulated yeah. media environment. You can be opinionated yeah. if you want to be. Yeah. Um, you know, is he the enemy? And, and no. you know, do you see him as that? No, we do not. And I think it's important to differentiate in your coverage of Trump what I would call the normal course of business and the abnormal course of business. President Trump is there to lead policy making on immigration. He's there to lead it on taxation. He's there to lead it um, with regard to uh, you know, whether or not to build a wall or whether or not to remain in the Paris Peace Accord. People can be passionately opposed to the positions that he takes on that, but we, we don't, CNN doesn't have a position on health care. We have got to say, you know, we, we, this is the arguments as outlined and these are the stories that we found. And as any other news organization, responsible news organization would, get people to sort of debate that and talk that through. We're not in that position of doing that on the normal course of business. He's the president. He should be making policy on those things and said he would make policy on those things. We then get into the abnormal, which is you know, the incredible prevaricating over disavowing the Ku Klux Klan over saying that, you know, you heard from the head of Mexico or the head of the Boy Scouts saying something, and those people saying, well, that didn't happen. That's not true. There's firing the head of the FBI over a Russian investigation. That is in the abnormal area. And in that area, we've seen our people and our key, correspond key correspondents, but particularly our key anchors, being given the freedom to say, this isn't normal. This isn't right. And if you're going to call us out for fake news, we're going to turn around and say, well, no, it isn't. You know, you've said this, these are the facts. You said this, and it's not true. This is true. Jamie, is there a difference in the way the BBC would behave? Well, I think, you know, inside the UK, we are, uh, you know, rightly held to, the, you know, the regulatory standards. We also apply those for our international audiences. And actually, just to echo what Tony says, you know, we run a commercial news company outside the UK, uh, and, um, and, and it has been good for business. You know, the Trump story is driving record audiences, and not only in North America, you know, around the world. So Americans want to know what the world thinks of us and our president, but around the world, people really, really like those kinds of stories. But I say, for us, you know, it, the, the BBC's, we, we, we know what we're competing on. We're competing on impartial and independent assessment of the presidency and actually we find audiences in North America like a bit of that from the BBC because they find the kind of you know hysteria domestically sometimes they want to take a step back from that and that's working well for us in North America. But isn't what all of you are are suggesting uh, you know pointing us towards the fact that there are there are a lot of people not just in America but around the world who don't trust the established media anymore who don't believe you who think you are fake news. Yeah, and that, that's really alarming, isn't it? And that, well, and that is something that ties it back to the UK, because I think one of the things you, know, you showed that, that your fantastic clip from, from Grenfell and um, the, you know, uh, the, the programme that you and John did down at Grenfell, I think one of the issues that is concerning in the UK is 
just a disengagement between certain sections of the audience and the mainstream media, and that probably has been fed overall by coverage of fake news. I think we need to be clear about what we're actually describing in the UK. It probably isn't a quality gap, and media literacy, if you like, is less of an issue here in the UK than it is in other, in other, in other countries. But I think every broadcaster, I'm sure you were struck by this, the BBC teams were certainly struck by this in reporting on Grenfell, that we felt we realised a distance had sprung up between us and sections of the audience. You know, we've seen that in relation to other stories. And it's a really useful reminder for all broadcasters and journalists in the UK about how you, we've got to be really mindful of that and make sure that we always try and draw those audiences closer to us and they continue to trust us. I mean, Ver Versha, I presume you have a slightly different position in that you have your audience that you're going for. Right. You're not too concerned about the people who hate you. No. Yeah. Yeah. So I think what, where we have found a gap in the market, both in terms of the distributed media model, so now this doesn't have a website, for those of you in the room who don't know, we exist entirely on social media. We distribute natively in your Facebook feed, Snapchat, Twitter, Instagram, et cetera. So there are two things here. I think there was a misconception when we started a couple years ago that young people just aren't interested in hard news or in politics. And we found that to be completely untrue. It was a matter of delivering the hard news and pol political news to them where they were already living on a daily basis, which was their social feeds. So we were early adopters of that model. We really took advantage of that. That's one reason why our audience has grown as explosively as it has. But I think another reason is people, especially young people in America, have kind of been tired of the false equivalences that you sometimes see on cable news networks. And that is that there are two sides to every story mm -hmm. and that you do have to debate both sides of every single issue. But actually, when you come to Charlottesville and the president saying that both sides are to blame for violence and that there are very fine people when we're talking about white supremacists, there aren't actually two sides to that issue. We're talking about hatred and bigotry on one side and racism and tolerance and diversity and respect on the other. So you don't need a panel of four people debating that to tell you that. You just need to say that straight out. And so I think our sort of like no bullshit approach to covering politics is one reason why we've engaged young people so much. I mean, is it, is it no bullshit or is it we're a liberal Facebook feed for people who hate Trump? <coughs> You know, and, th and that's why you get shared, because there are loads of people who are like that, who want that. I mean, our critics definitely see us that way, but I think, you know, we, we called Hillary Clinton out several times during the campaign. Um, we certainly have a younger, progressive point of view, but we, we basically describe it as saying we have the millennial point of view. And if you look at where people under 35 in America are on the issues, they are overwhelmingly, you know, for social justice, for issues of equality. We don't think it's controversial to say that we're for those things as well. And we will look at the political candidates and report on them through that lens. And now this wants to be the CNN of the future in terms of scale. Yes. Or do you think you've already so, overtaken them? I mean, we do. We actually, uh, to correct you earlier, we do over 2.5 billion monthly views now. So mm -hmm. we're, I mean, we're growing at such a fast rate and it's really exciting. And I think we also reach different audiences. Do, do you have the same journalistic values though, Tony? Well, I think, I, mean, I, I don't know enough about their business to sort of, to comment on that. I mean, they use a lot of your clips in their videos. Well, in that case, I think you're a very good business. <laughs> Not a lot. To be fair, the Obama interview Can we have some of your clips? Yeah. The Obama interview clip you saw there, CNN ran without asking us for permission, so yeah. it goes oh. both ways. Yeah. So that would be one, then. Where's the yeah. others? <laughs> Um, I, I think what we see on CNN, and I think big media companies, I don't want to get too diverted on this, but the, is that between the TV channel, the international TV channel, then the website, then the mobile business, and then the, the social media business, you see the, the age come down across those different platforms. And then we do things like Great Big Story or, or, or Snapchat. and we, so, so what we're trying to do is bring people into the CNN family at different points. You were saying earlier on that you speak to a lot of students, and so do I. I speak to a lot of students who know a huge amount about CNN, I mean, and they talk to me about the reporters and the different things that we do, and I ask them what shows they watch, and they never watch us on TV at all. You know, they, they experience us entirely through either our, our own web presences or what they've seen that's been shared in, in terms of social media. So I think that we as content creators can't get too hung up on any individual platform. We've got to be available in all of those different platforms. And I think what's interesting to us 
is that the stuff that gets shared by younger people does be, tend to be the stuff that we tend to be more proud of. So it's either you know, us being in the teeth of the fake news debate, or it's a great Arwood Damon report or Clarissa Ward report. They, they're the stories that then get circulated and spread around. We had a big story with Arwood who was trapped under fire. And the social sharing of that was just massive, massive. I mean, I, I haven't seen any research, but the amount that would have been seen outside of TV compared to inside TV would be a huge, huge disparity. But Damien, I mean, the big issue on social is actual fake news that is out there purporting to be real news, hmm. competing with real news and being shared. Yeah. And I mean, we've seen today Facebook have announced that they're going to start putting logos yeah. on their trending list so that we can see what the sources of news yeah. are before we click on them. Yeah. Is that going to work? Well, it's, it's, a, it's one good thing. I mean, it's something that, that I've called for in the past as part of the select committee's work on this. Um, and it's, it helps users navigate the system. So it's easier to identify one news story over another. I think it's actually even more important on Google News than it is on face, Facebook. It's Google News. You search, you get a list of uh, relevant articles. An article written in the New York Times is given, could be presented in exactly the same way with the same prominence as you know, a blog site somewhere in, you know, by a citizen journalist somewhere in the world. So I think tools that help people navigate are important. And of course, whilst we've been discussing mostly the output of specific news organisations, most people, well, increasingly, most younger people are consuming their news shared through social, social platforms. I saw some figures on the, on the, on the uh, dwell time on different websites that are used. Google and Facebook combined is about 27% of time on, on the, on, uh, online. B the BBC is 2%. Yeah. Now, when people see a CNN or a BBC news story online, if they consume media in that way, the chances are they're getting it via Facebook. They may not challenge its validity as much because it's been shared by a friend. And of course, the way the echo chamber systems you know, on social platforms, I mean, Twitter's probably the worst of this, but it's, it's true across all social media platforms, the news people consume then tends to reflect what their own peer group think. But and then, and, and, there's, and there's, there is no media, then plurality goes. The idea of alternative opinions, different points of view is taken away. And even national media platforms, international media platforms can struggle to break that down. So the question is then, I think there's a slow preamble to it, but is what are the tools you can use to fight back in a media world like that? And I think when, that there is a responsibility then for companies like Google and Facebook. They've had to face that responsibility when it comes to the distribution of pirated content online, although I'm sure there are lots of people here in Edinburgh who'd feel the need to go a lot further down that path to do it, about cyberbullying, illicit material. They, they understand they have a social obligation to do it. Here, what we're basically talking about for the social media platforms is a form of virality. It's virality, but it's based around news stories rather than something else. They can spot it. They should be able to identify stories that could be fake and check and challenge them, act against them to delist known sites and sources of fake news, just as they do against pirated content and illicit material. And also, in, for certainly sites like Facebook, which are really run on the basis of user referral, when they're getting user referral and complaints about stories that are known to be fake, are they acting against those stories and the sources of them? And if they're not, they're in breach of their own guidelines. And I think we then have to think about what should the sanctions be against a company that knowingly allows, and maybe even profiting from, the distribution of fake news. So you could see legislation to combat fake news. Well, I think that for me, I think that I mean th this is something that we will look to go through in our inquiry, and there, the, you know, there's been a Senate inquiry, there's an inquiry in Australia at the moment as well. I think this is something that parliaments around the world are starting to take an interest in. Now, I, what we can't see, obviously, is the state regulation. We can't have someone in the Home Office, basically, like like the Lord Chamberlain, rubber stamping news articles saying that they're true. But I think what we should say for the platforms and the news company, the platforms in particular, is to say that if you are not acting against sources of fake news you know are true, is there a sanction against you? Is there a, a new, should we create an offence of failure to act against a company that fails to act against fake news or illicit material or whatever it is? In the Digital Economy Act that was passed just before the general election, one of the amendments the government accepted was on creating a code of practice for social media companies as well. It's yet to be determined what will go in that code of practice. But I think you know, the sanctions against companies who fail, fail to uphold their own community guidelines on the sort of content information that's shared, and that's a very legitimate area for us to look at. And of course, in Germany, there are already hefty fines that could be levied against companies that, that fail to act in this way. If you want to come into the conversation at any point from now on, please just put your hand up and I'll, I'll bring you in. There are roving mics. You can also co contribute through your app um, if you go to the Taking Part button. And some of you already have. Um, because, I mean, the conversation so far has really been about these terrible people out there who are purveyors of fake news and these awful politicians who are accusers of things that are, are untrue. But is there, is there some guilt within the established media as well? I mean, somebody... 
takes us to where I was going to go anyway, Jamie, which is um, anonymous. Uh, <laughs> if, if the UK does not have a fake news problem, why did the 350 million for the NHS on a bus get through during a crucial political campaign? Yeah. So I'm, you, I'm reliving now my sort of pain from my, from my past life and my previous existence. So I, I think the BBC, you know, we've moved a lot of resources into what we're talking about, slow news and reality check and brands, digital mainly brands this year, that really um, double down on fact checking, on calling out the real facts behind, you know, political arguments. And, you know, James Harding's talked a lot about this. And the reason we're doing that is we're, because we listened very carefully to criticisms from audiences. And actually, a lot of this predates the, uh, predates the Bre Brexit referendum. It also came up during the independence referendum topically. We're, we're here in Edinburgh today. That, you know, there is a kind of caricature of news, news reporting, which is, you know, campaign A says this and campaign B says that. Um, who's to know who's right? Only time will tell. And that's the kind of parody. It's exactly yeah. what version was speaking. Uh, right. and, 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 and audiences told us very clearly that they saw a bit too much of this, not just on the BBC, but, but including us, and that they wanted us to be more bold in calling out the facts around arguments. And Reality Check is a big response to that. You know, uh, during the referendum, we, ha we got into very detailed arguments, both around... Uh, the 350 million. Uh, we published a reality check on that. We said that we didn't. We, we said that it was false, but we also said that the Remain uh, camp's claim uh, about uh, you know how household incomes would fall, the OECD figures on the falls in household income were also false. So we were able to demonstrate we could do that across the campaign. I think you know there is clearly you know clearly these arguments will continue on. My personal view is that the 350 million pound claim is it relates to something which might happen in the future. So it's kind of, in a sense, it's uncheckable. But it doesn't mean people don't still feel So it was impossible to call it fake, a fake claim. Well, I mean, I, the, the question is, was the, was the news that reported the £350 million pound claim hmm. fake news? Because, because it was reporting it on Look, face value. I, I think, you know, I'm sure your newsrooms wrestled with this particularly. You know, there was a whole issue about it's on the bus, should, you know, do we picture the bus? But it seems to me to be, I mean, no, I was, it was radio, so it was easier, but um, <laughs> it seemed to me to be very, it, almost impossible to get yourself in a position where you were going to censor the main campaign message of one side of the argument. And I think you had to, we, we, you know, we were in a position where we had to put the appropriate context and facts around that and around the arguments of the other side. And uh, the BBC did that and, we, we stand by what we did in that campaign. Tony, I mean, would you have a different perspective? It's interesting, when you were talking then, I was thinking that when we do international news at CNN, um, the moment when it really comes alive, and to be fair on other news media as well, is when your international correspondent is, finds himself in a war zone or a, or a place of conflict, and they say, you know, the government has said today that this, this, and this has happened in that town. Well, I've just been there, and that's not true this, it's like this and this. And we all recognise that's when our business is really at its best. Yet in domestic news, that seems like a much higher barrier to cross to say, well, that's clearly not true. You know, well, for whatever reason it came around, we'll go investigate it, but clearly the claim, the claim doesn't stand. And, and, and I think that the issue for us in the US is we have called out clearly things that are not true. This president has said something and it isn't true. Now that's, that's a big thing, or was once. Now it's become more routine, is the truth of the matter, in terms of that kind of story and how often we've addressed that kind of story. So I think as news media, we have to move along. Now, of course, the way the BBC is funded and the facts that are there, you know, you know much more about that than I do, and that might present certain constraints. But I think you know, there's no doubt that audiences are looking to you to call it when you see it. I mean, the flip side, Jamie, and I'm not, this is not, I'm not attacking the BBC at all, I'm just kind of using you as a person who speaks within the British media, um, is that the other side of the argument would say, you know, there were also lies. You know, there, there were all those lies about how the British economy would fall off a cliff the day after a Brexit vote, how things were going to, you know, uh, be, be a disaster straight away. And the, the, the media, the mainstream media, although I hate that phrase, um, were getting it wrong day after day after day. Now, the question is, where does that, where do, where do things that are just wrong um, cross over into fake news? So ha yeah, it, it, the question is, how do you lie about things that could happen in the future? So, you know, we, we had a similar argument around one of, the, one of the claims that was tested was, you know, was Turkey going to join the EU? You know, well, well probably not, but potentially, you know, it's very, very difficult to 
call out right or wrong about people who are campaigning on things that may or may not happen in the future. And I think what organisations, you know, the BBC with Reality Check, but also actually other news organisations, we've all done this, let's be honest, is that the audiences, audiences just believe that there are sets of reputable facts and statistics provided by, you know, reputable internet, you know, climate scientists, the OECD, the World Health Organisation, and they just want broadcasters to do their jobs, which is to curate those figures and facts and present them in, a, in an understandable form. And I think, you know, the, we, we've all ended up on similar territory. But I suppose my point is, are, are sites like Breitbart mm. and Canary thriving because we are failing, or just because there are people who have always thought those sorts of things? Well, that's, what I, well, that's why I began by talking about political comments, Alex, and I, I ha have no wish to kind of constrain or restrict that, because I think part of the, the, you know, the wonderful society that we live in and our tradition of freedom of streets is that people can publish really kind of vibrant and tricky stuff uh, that, get, that, that some people find offensive, and that's as true in the political sphere as it is elsewhere. And I think, but we just need to be clear about that that is, that, that is one particular type of argument, but it is not the totality of the fake news argument. Yes, can we get a microphone down here on the second row? I think there's a real danger of us being very British and very complacent about this. Uh, you, all this thing, you know, it doesn't happen here. We're a sophisticated, mature democracy with lovely institutions, so it doesn't happen here. Well, it does. Just think about the messaging that came about through Cambridge Analytica in the referendum, which was covered over in the very, very funny, very, very suspect deal between Vote Leave and Leave EU. The nice posh Tory party is saying a certain kind of lie, but nailable for it. Meanwhile, all the stuff funded by Steve Bannon and the Mercers going <coughs> to Cambridge Analytica, going to people... Let's just be careful on names because we are in public. I don't want to so, say anything well, well, that's going to get no, in trouble. There is no doubt <laughs> that that linkage exists. There is no doubt that the Mercers fund uh, Cambridge Analytica, and there's no doubt that Steve Bannon was on its board. We don't know the content of those messages because it was all wiped. Uh, but I, you know, yeah, we sorry. shouldn't be complacent about any of that stuff. We shouldn't be complacent. In a more sophisticated democracy, there are things called, there are fake organizations, ostensibly think tanks, which are really lobbies, overwhelmingly <coughs> lobbies, who put up fake people. So they're a fake organization putting up fake people who... To be interviewed on television. To be interviewed yeah. by you on television in order to appear on Question Time. We don't know who pays for them. We don't know what their real agenda is. And we don't know what their, as it were, backstories and credentials are. That's fake news of a more sophisticated kind. So just very briefly, so uh, I, I'm not complacent and neither is the BBC. We've shifting millions of pounds of our news operations into specifically addressing some of the things that you've raised. And secondly, I didn't say it wasn't a problem. I just said I'm, I'm making a plea for relativism, which is to look at outward and beyond our shores and the shores of the US. Um, and I think, you know, the, I'm not surprised to hear the, the passionately held view expressed, but I think it's helpful if it doesn't, you know, the more we sort of seek to do this as a, re, as a sort of rerun or do-over of the Brexit campaign, I think that's, a, that's not, not, not the best climate to do this in. I think the pro problem is wider and more complex than that. I mean, T Tony, I mean, th this question of sort of the experts or the fake experts, mm. that's one that touches on you as well, isn't it? I mean, I, I forget the name of the, 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 the opinionated contributor you hired who... who, who um, who, who was fired for the Zeke Isle, but... Um, Jeffrey Lord. Yes, I mean... Thank you. you. <laughs> aren't, aren't, we followed that one closely. Aren't, aren't you in a situation where you do find yourselves hiring people to say things that are gathering currency, which may or may not be true? Well, I think with the, with the particular challenge that we've had with Trump is that Trump sits outside of the Republican mainstream to quite a large extent. So when he says certain things or he's involved in certain things, the Republican mainstream isn't as available as you might think. So you've got to get people who are of that ilk, who are, who are supportive of what it is and what he stands for. So it's sort of hire a liar. Not really, no. I wouldn't say that, Christian. No, but I mean, I, I think, you know, they, 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 there's no doubt they believe a lot of what it is that they say. I think there's a danger of being too dismissive here. I mean, people will say that one of the areas where the American media got it wrong with Trump is they were too keen to be dismissive of both him and his base. And so understanding the mindset, even now there's still, you know, a substantial base support for Trump. 
And, you know, we as a media are struggling to get our arms around that. <clears throat> and we, anybody who can help fill that out, we can't just dismiss them as, you know, fake news or liars. We need to understand that better. We should certainly question them. Um, should certainly fire them if they send stupid tweets. But you know, we, we, we absolutely need to fill out our understanding. I think there's a difference, though, between having somebody like Jeffrey Lord or even bringing Kellyanne Conway on the Sunday shows in America still. Uh, she's not giving us any information. She's not answering any questions. She's doing what she can to sidestep every question there is out there. So what is the purpose of continuing to bring somebody who denies reality and dies, denies the truth on TV? I'll answer that for you. If you think about the, the truth of what people reveal themselves as, isn't just down to the words they say. Sometimes a politician or a politician representative coming on and failing to answer questions um, is very re revealing. I would suggest that more of Christian's interviews where he's beaten up people who are trying to get out of saying something have probably been shared than ones where people have given a detailed exposition of their position, because that is in itself revealing. Um, so I don't believe it's our job to say, well, you haven't passed our you know, threshold of, you know, smart things to say so you can't come on. If that's what they say and that's what they believe and that's the route they want to take, let them say it and let people make a judgment. Do you have anything you want to add on this? Or? Um, well, just, just, I, I just want to go back to what Peter said about sort of, you know, fake people and fake organisations. I think maybe there is a challenge there for us to be slightly tougher on people. It's very easy for someone to come on from an organisation you've never heard of, you don't know who they are. They say something that's nonsense. Where, where's, where's the address? You know, we don't know who they are. But the other thing, the next phase of fake news too, you know, we're largely talking about fake news in places it can be seen. But the next stage will be using, you know, direct contact social media through Snapchat, through WhatsApp. Now, companies making money out of the distribution of these messages. No one regulates it. No one knows what's being said. In an election campaign, no one takes responsibility. And you can't, can you? Is the truth? I mean, can, can you can you do anything about? Well, the trouble is, our election law predates almost predates social media. You know, almost predates the internet. And no one's really looked at it. Look, looked at the capability of of a campaign like during the referendum to to mobilise uh, direct contact millions of people. I mean, the the Facebook, by their own report on the French presidential election, they said they deleted thirty five thousand fake accounts that were disseminating news linked to the presidential election. <coughs> Millions of people at the touch of a button being hit. And Facebook, in some cases, or you know, companies may be making money out of you know, paid for content to push messages. And no, the companies themselves don't really monitor what goes on. None of the electoral authorities think it's their responsibility. And someone would only be caught down the line and, pros and maybe prosecuted, but that's very unlikely. And this will get worse because the, these will be increasingly the media of choice these people will use. And, uh, another coward has, has put on the app. Um, <laughs> is... is <laughs> is there a danger that you're, this is for you, Damien, is there a danger that you're asking Facebook and Google to become the authority on what is and isn't free speech? Is that the right thing to do? No, and that's why I said that um, I th thought it should be a failure to act rather than a sort of upfront method of you know, censorship pre-publication. Social media companies only work on the basis of the contents user generated. If what the users are generating stuff that is known to be lies, the virality of the, the vir virality monitoring on the site, site shows a clear <laughs> spike. <laughs> <laughs> You're right, right the first. <laughs> <laughs> shows a clear spike of interest in a story you can check pretty easily isn't true, and people are complaining about it. And if you say, well, there's nothing to do with us, the community have generated it, then that's when you should act. So I think it is it is acting in response to something which is demonstrated to be clearly a lie. Yes, gentlemen. Hi, uh, Ben Fenton with Edelman. Um, before I was with Edelman, I was with the Financial Times and the Daily Telegraph for 25 years, um, in which capacity I covered a lot of disasters. And uh, like you, Krishnan, I, I know that uh, the police always give a very low fatality number, knowing that it's going to rise because that's how they have to be certain that they're right. Um, but when I joined uh, the, the, the journalistic profession, there were very few publishers. So people who disagreed with the police's number on a particular uh, disaster because they knew locally the, uh, what their version of the truth was had no way of communicating it to the general public. Today, there are seven billion potential publishers on this planet. They can all publish their opinion or their version of facts. And obviously what differentiates them from you or what I used to do was the fact that we, by virtue of the scale of our organisations and their record, have an authority and credibility that an individual can never have. And I'm wondering if this isn't the path towards establishing a, a counterblast to fake news, some sort of way of establishing authority and credibility on platforms where the platforms themselves can perhaps 
come you know, with algorithms or, or something, say the same way as we get ratings on Amazon or on eBay, this person has got credibility, you can trust them, you can do business with them because they're Channel 4 or CNN or whoever. Whereas the other person has never been heard of before today and has just popped up and, and said this thing has been published twice. And I'm just wondering if the panel could maybe comment. I'm, if I'm that, I think it's a good idea. My concern is I think the sort of people that game these sites anyway to push fake news will game that as well. You'd have to design it in a very careful way that you didn't end up with the worst fake news sites being the top rated in terms of their reliability because they've got lots of other fake accounts to recommend and support so, I mean, those stories. Your role is to put pressure on these people, to, on Facebook and Google and others, to actually put as much effort into solving this democratic threat, of, you know, mitigating this democratic threat, as they do into making money out of the news that they're generating. Uh, absolutely, and that's, why, and that's why we're holding the inquiry. And I, uh, one thing I would say, though, I, I think for the news industries, we've been talking so much about that, is you look at the case of music. Now, it was definitely the case that music companies were being ripped off by pirated music being you know, pushed out very easily, and, and it just will go on. But the sites have acted to make it much harder and to take down sites that are known, known propagators of it. But alongside that, the music industry has also innovated to try, and, to try and create other ways of consuming music, which makes the appeal of just seeking out d tracks you can download for free less appealing. And I think there is a similar challenge for news here too, which is to say, you know, yes, let's combat the known worst sources of it and think about the responsibilities the platform should have and what the government can do to support that. But there's got to be a bit of a challenge for the news industry too, because what, the, day when, the days when the the head of BBC News had a big influence on, on the news people consumed in this country are, are going. I mean, Virgil, as, as the new entrant who's established a name for yourselves online, how, how have you developed a reputation? I mean, you know, because the, the, you know, the giants say, well, the thing we've got is our reputation. You've suddenly got a reputation. You've done it really quickly. How have you done that? I think there are a couple things that we did. It's, it's the quantity of content, but more importantly, it's the quality of what we've been publishing. And we're always very transparent with our audience about where we're coming from. We clearly label what's a news video, what is an op-ed video, what's an original production or exclusive interview. And you still don't always see that, as we were talking about earlier. Some news organizations mm -hmm. kind of muddy the lines between what's opinion, commentary, and actual news. Um, so we've been very clear about that from the beginning. And I think we also take advantage of the fact that we are publishing natively on these platforms to interact with our audience as much as we can. And I think that's a big factor in building or rebuilding audience trust is going to be the actual publishers and news organizations connecting directly with their readers and viewers and talking to them and taking their feedback. So what I'm not quite clear about is what is the difference between the viewers of Now This saying we trust Now This and the viewers of the Canary who say we trust the Canary, or the viewers of Breitbart say we, we, we trust Breitbart. They would all give their respective websites huge trust ratings. I mean, there is an issue, isn't there, around people seeking out this sort of filter bubble or you know, whatever you want to refer it. People seek out a news experience that validates their existing prejudices, yeah. beliefs, worldviews. And that is probably a phenomenon that's with us to stay. So where does we, that we leave an organisation like the exactly. BBC that wants well, to be all things to all people? So when people don't want having a go at Labour one well, way I, and then having a go at the Tories the next? Well, I, I don't think the two things are mutually exclusive, and, and you won't be surprised to hear me push back a bit about or what Damien said about you know, the, the influence of an organisation like the BBC in setting the agenda. That is partly what the BBC is there to do. It's owned by everyone in the UK. It's accountable in that way. And we think, I, I just wanted to cycle back to this a bit earlier, because I think there is a bit of a risk in this conversation that, that says the world is exploding very, very, you know, unbelievably quickly into digital news and all traditional platforms are going to hell in a handcart. And I'm sure Tony will back me up and say, you know, internationally, you know, BBC World News is now reaching 100 million people a week. Our audience went up on, for the... For the TV channel by 12% last year. News audiences in the UK are healthy and growing. Uh, you know, there aren't news organisations who are innovating, who are making incre increasing commercial returns. So I, I, I want people to understand that although this is a really, really serious issue, the dominance of kind of traditional platforms is still, in terms of audience numbers, is still actually pretty well entrenched. Oh, and what we're looking at is a phenomenon, particularly around younger consumers, that we need to be aware of and to, to take account of, but it is not the case yeah. that these audiences have disappeared. No, not at all. No, no, I agree with that completely. I mean, I think there was a narrative not so long ago in the US that cable news was in long-term decline, irrespective of the channel. It's absolutely not true. Yeah. Cable news audiences are at record levels in the US, not just ours, other people's as well, um, and internationally as well. 
So I, I think there was all, there, we, well, when I came to this, uh, last came to this festival, there was a big talk then about you know how digital was taking over and TV would fall behind and. What the news channel did, was dead, wasn't it? Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. But what people do, of course, is they, they, they multitask. So they watch TV and they're on their phones at the same time as they watch television. Television viewing has gone up. There's no real reason why that should happen, given all the other sources of media that are available, only if people are doing it as well as doing other things. And the other thing, which we won't get into here, I'm sure you'll talk elsewhere across the week, is that you know, there's still far more money in television than there is in digital. You know, you, if you've got big TV ratings, that's much easier to monetize than good digital numbers. It's just that's just the reality. It doesn't matter who which business you are. That's the reality. For Could all just of stress them. that briefly with now this. I mean, does now, does, is now this financially viable? Yes. Or are you just backed by? I mean, you're making enough through advertising on Facebook. We are in in 2017 through monetizing our videos through mid-roll, through having a separate department called Now The Studios that does all branded content. So we... we oh, so are you're funded through branded content rather than through your Facebook views. Right, it's a combination. Yeah. We have different revenue streams. That's pretty alarming though, isn't it, as a business model? What, branded content? If, if, if your... I mean, your name is being made by your Facebook views. You're getting billions of Facebook views. But you're only financially viable because you're making branded content. No, there are three different, at least three different revenue streams that we're pulling money from. And we do, we also have investors. So I was telling you earlier, Discovery Networks has invested $100 million in us because they believe that we are viable, slash they may want to buy us one day because of that reason. So I think the new sort of distributed media model is finding revenue from all of these different sorts of streams and models. And it's not just one, it's not singular. There's, there's never been more sort of new world digital money going into TV than there is now. So if you look at, you know, Facebook's TV projects, what Apple are doing, what Amazon are doing, what Netflix are doing, the problem is in the news industry. So most of this money is going into scripted TV and drama. And I think we've got, a, you know, an issue about how do we make sure that a proportion of that unprecedented investment in visual content. People love video, they love the television experience, they love streaming and watching online. But some of that investment has got to go into reinforcing quality news because of the overall net public benefit to the stabilities of societies in the UK and elsewhere. I mean, Tony, there, there is a question here, isn't there, that, you know, that, uh, we, we all sort of uh, have these angst-ridden conversations about how you trust things on Facebook and how we've got to compete on Facebook, and we benefit from the reach of Facebook yet we don't get anything back from it. Yeah. Uh, it makes you wonder why established news providers don't just stop putting their stuff on Facebook. Well, I think that's and leave Facebook to the, the new entrants or the fakes. Yeah, but it's difficult to be the first one that steps back because you know, the, the, that is such, the, there's simply so much of our material that is now shared via those platforms that there's not an easy answer to this. I mean, uh, there, there certainly isn't, you know, oh, well, if we do this and this, then this will work out. I think that the role of, we seem to talk about Facebook a lot, but we've mentioned them a lot. I think the role of Facebook in terms of how it disseminates information, how it brands it, how it exhibits quality control is very legitimate. And actually, I, and I, I wouldn't know about this development you were involved in, and it strikes me as, you know, a highly legitimate thing to look at. I, I think that people haven't really clocked quite how big and significant Facebook is. We do, because we focus on it all the time, but I don't think other people realize the stretch and its influence, and it's still a little bit, you know, that really clever guy with the hoodie, and, you know, it's all sort of come out of people sort of sharing pictures of the family and stuff, and now it is like the major player. It has got massive resources and has to step up to the plate for those responsibilities. Yes, up at the back. We're in the last few minutes, so if you want to say something, then do put your hand up now. Hi. Um, I, I would like to challenge the gentleman from CNN who claimed that the Trump campaign had no effect on the public's trust of the media. That, that's just not true. Um, you quoted a CNN poll, which is obviously self-serving, but if you look at a Gallup poll, and anybody can, can look it up now, Gallup poll suggests that trust in the media is at an all-time low. So I, I think it's important as a member of the media that, that you don't just cherry pick your own sources for information like that, but it, it, the trust in the media is, is at an all time low. It's been, outside of the CNN poll, it has been um, uh, credited to a lot of other polls. So I, I wonder if you want to respond to that. Sure, no, I mean, I, I, the, the specific question I was asked is, had this impacted the trust in CNN? And we commissioned an independent poll. We had no point in doing a self-serving poll for that to see whether or not it had eroded our brand. We need to understand that commercially as well as editorially. 
And the evidence of that poll was it had not. And the evidence of our ratings from both digital and TV is that actually on all fronts we're up. Yeah, if you're saying that, if you, but the, the point, but I. Ratings, ratings is the problem. The problem is, is that you are citing ratings and I'm talking about trust. And that, that's the problem with the media. That's, that's, that's the whole problem with the media is that when media went to a ratings driven, profit driven enterprise, then it, I think it, it left itself open to criticism. In other words, before news media was, was run by ratings, back in the old days, Watergate and, and even 60 Minutes, and 60 Minutes kind of changed the business in that way, when CBS realized that news could get ratings, CNN is, 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 is riding high on ratings, but ratings and trust, they don't correlate. So saying that the ratings are high and therefore CNN is trusted as ever is that those things do not correlate, and, and I think it's important for people to understand that. Well, I'm afraid, I'm afraid they do. I mean, people don't watch news organizations they don't trust, certainly not in any kind it's of sustained kind of a it's way. It's not news, it's I, uh, Your wider point about being, sorry, the wider point about being obsessed with ratings, I think there's something to that, and I think that's a separate discussion, but I do think there's something to that. But the truth of the matter is that our audiences would not watch us in greater numbers for longer periods of time across more platforms if they didn't trust us. If you want to say there is a certain part of the population that doesn't trust the media, never did, and trusts it less than ever, I think that's also true. Yeah, that's Both not, of those things can be true at the, the same time. Saying. The Gallup poll is saying that more people do not trust the media than ever before. Not, not that certain people trust it less. More people. Only and is that just one poll you're quoting? What's the Gallup poll? But, but, but I've done research on this, and 35% okay. and, and of the country in the US um, trust the media and think it's fair, which, which to my calculation means that 65% don't. Thank you. Yeah, it's a good point. I mean, the, the, the most recent numbers I saw, I think, were from an Ipsos Mori poll in Britain in trust in, in broadcasters. And it was still remarkably high. It was well over 80% yeah, of, you of viewers trust figures, believe yeah. what they see on, on the television news. I think the trust figures are notably different in the US to the rest of the world, and we, we've been looking at this this year. And I think what we need to worry about in the UK and globally is if the figures start to shift a, a bit more towards the US model, where there has clearly been an erosion of overall trust in, uh, you know, to quote, mainstream media. I think one of the interesting things about the US is it's, it's difficult to tell whether the country's political division predated the division in its, in its me national media or whether the two things have kind of fed across each other. But I think everyone, I mean, Tony would know more, and you would both know more from living there, but it seems to me that those things have to come back together a bit. The erosion of those, um, those kind of fixed point national news broadcasts has been a factor in the increasing political division in the US. And I think one of the things we need to reinforce is actually the fact that there are fixed points in broadcast news, both on, you know, on the BBC and ITN for Sky News and our comp competitors and for Channel 4 News, where people come together around agreed fixed points in the day to sort of par partake in a national conversation. That's a really bit important thing to dig in and defend. I, I don't know whether we can, end, uh, whether you'll have an answer to this <laughs> to end with, but is, I mean, is there, if, if there was sort of one thing that you could change or, or do or bring in that would make the problem of fake news, if it is a problem, less of a problem for you, uh, or the accusation of being fake news less of a problem, what would it be? Well, it's impossible, but I wish people stopped throwing it around as easily as they do. I mean, just to say some, someone's saying something you don't like and throw that line out, I particularly encourage politicians to say, who does that? And do you want to be able to do it in the same way as the people that do that? I think publishers, news organizations, and consumers have to put pressure on platforms like Facebook and Google to do better. And they're taking steps. They say they're going to label what's fake, what's not. But a neo-Nazi article about the Charlottesville attack was classified under news on Facebook last week. That shouldn't be happening. And so I think we all collectively need to put more pressure on them. Um, the digital model has broken the link structurally between content creators getting the val full value and commercial returns for what they've done in the commercial sector. The BBC, for obvious reasons, have less of a problem with this. We've invested additional money this year, for example, from the licence fee into local news reporting, which I know is something that came up in Grenfell, and we'd like others to step up and do the same. And like everyone who's bought a local paper and supports their local papers, I want to see local journalism get better value back from their audiences commercially for what they do. Yeah, I think that there's no doubt in my mind that the platforms, the big platforms like Google and Facebook, could do more to combat identifiable sources of fake news. Now, that is not the only part of the solution. You know, user education about valid sources of news is important as well. 
the terminology fake news, if we could re remove that from this being a, a term of abuse in politics, that would be good. Uh, do you know what I'd love to see? If an interviewer is, is interviewing a politician and the politician accuses them of fake news, I think the interviewer should say, you're calling me a liar. Uh, I'd, like, I'd, li I'd like to see a bit of pushback on it. Watch my interview with David Day. <laughs> 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 we must leave it there. Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you for watching.